But yeah, I'd like to start with a, a recap of really of, of everything I said last time. Uh, so let me let me get started. Right, the first theorem we had was this existence of sort of miniversal presentations, or in other words, like the minimal smooth presentations of an algebraic stack, where namely that you you can you can always find. Uh, okay, uh, given these hypotheses that of an Ethereum algebraic stack, and I'm taking a finite type point and a, a smooth stabilizer group, then I can find a smooth presentation u over x of minimal, uh, so whose relative dimension is equal to the dimension of the stabilizer. So in particular, if the stabilizer is finite, then you get an tau cover. Right, and, and what we showed was that this was a miniversal deformation so that we showed that, that uh, sort of, yeah, that it, it uh, that the, the induced map on tangent spaces at U is an isomorphism. That was the sort of the, our definition of miniversal presentation. And then we, we also then could sort of use this to show that if X is say finite type over a field and uh, the stack is smooth at X, then we can compute the dimension of the tangent, the, the dimension of the stack, at least locally at, as the dimension of the tangent space of this vector space minus the dimension of the stabilizer. Yep, and right, and like well, our, our most important application of this theorem was in the case of delene mumford stacks, and we get, we're able to give this equivalent characterization of delene mumford stacks. So if you have an arbitrary Ethereum, yeah, if you have an Ethereum algebraic stack, you can check it's delene mumford by just showing that all the points have finite and reduced stabilizer groups. And the upshot of this is that it's much easier to show that certain moduli stacks are just algebraic. Uh, and then you can then apply this corollary to get that it's Delene Mumford. And so we use this to get that MG is Delene Mumford. Right. And then we discussed two additional notions, both that had their own value of the criterion. We talked about smoothness. We talked about properness. Smoothness uh, was the following lifting criterion uh, that that uh, so that a morphism of algebraic stacks is smooth if and only if for every such diagram here there exists uh, there exists a lifting. Right, and then like you can you then uh, a townness was there's a unique lifting on ramified is there is at most one lifting, but we're mostly concerned about smoothness, and I guess it, uh, often, sort of the existence of such a, a a lifting translates into a very explicit question. Often there's an obstruction. To the existence. <laughs> There's an obstruction to the existence of, of this lift, which is measured by an element, which is like the obstruction itself is an element of a, a cohomology group. Right, and maybe I shouldn't say often, maybe I should say always because, you know, and it, there's, there's always, you know, like, it, okay, it, in a high degree of generality, you always have a cotangent complex, and that is exactly measuring, or you can use that to, to, to give an obstruction to the existence of this lifting. It's an X, X class of this cotangent complex. But, uh, but, but that's often very abstract. And for moduli problems, you can often, the, the cohomology group is usually explicit, and you can compute it, and you can then use this to verify smoothness. And that's what we did last time. Right, for, for MG, like if, if you have 
One is that it, it suffices to check on local rings. So if you have a diagram like this for MG, say over spec Z, then if these are, are local, uh, say local Artinian, then you can restrict to the residue field. And then this is a curve, you know, uh, over a field. And then the existence of, of this, of an error like this, what we showed uh, is determined by a cohomology class and obstruction in H2 of C of the tangent bundle. As long as, okay, yeah, well, as long as you assume this is a small extension. Meaning that the kernel, the kernel is actually just the, the, the field K itself. Otherwise, you need to just tensor with the, uh, the ideal sheaf defining this infinitesimal extension of Martin rings. But, but the point was that we, we could, you know, this is quite explicit in the case of curves that because curves are dimension one, this vanishes. So the obstruction always vanishes and there always exists, at, there exists a lifting. So this, this we, we use to conclude that MG is smooth. All right, and the last topic we, we discussed was properness and I raced through that. So I wanted to take some time and explain both separatedness and properties for algebraic stacks. So the, the definitions are sort of like, um, yeah, so the def definition of a morphism of algebraic stacks being separated is that the diagonal is proper. Right, that's the first definition. And, and then properness is that the morphism is finite type, universally closed and separated this, and separated. Uh, right, these are the definitions and you might be worried that they're sort of circular because separatedness is defined in terms of properness, properness is defined in terms of separatedness. And I was trying to be careful last time, but I went quickly. But the point is that um, sort of separatedness is defined in terms of properties of the diagonal and you sort of bootstrap earlier notions. So the diagonal is representable. And so you, so you first define properness for morphisms of, of uh, algebraic spaces uh, and, then, and then so on. Hopefully that, yeah, that's okay now. Uh, but yeah, it does require some work to precisely define these, these notions. But in, our, in, a, uh, in the case of schemes, we recover the usual notion. If X is a scheme, then uh, remember that that always implies that the diagonal is a locally closed immersion. And then it being separated is, is equivalent to being a closed immer uh, immersion or that the image under the diagonal is closed. So X separated. is equivalent to the diagonal being um, a closed map or closed immersion. And it's also the same as saying it's finite or even proper because the diagonal in this case is a monomorphism. And uh, so, and then going to the, 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 to the world of stacks, maybe a first example of something that should be separated is BG for a finite group. BG uh, if G is, is finite. And BG is, is separated uh, because, it, because the, if you look at the diagonal and you base change, you get G, G itself, right? And this is, this is a, even a, this is an Atal cover. And this map is finite. Right. And actually, for a similar reason, you see that the classifying stack of an abelian variety or an elliptic curve is, is proper. Uh, yeah. Well, in particular, separated. But let, let me give you another sort of example, uh, example of sort of a, a, a new type of non-separatedness for, for Deleen-Mumford stacks, even. So. So let's consider the action of, of Z2 on the, on the non-separated affine line. Let's call it U, which is equal to the affine line 
with uh, two origins. And let's take the, the action which, swap, which uh, fixes everything except for the two origins which it swaps, except swaps the origins. And, and then uh, I'm gonna take this quotient, u mod z2. And my picture is that well, basically it looks like the affine line. And because everything outside the origin is fixed, there's sort of a generic z2 stabilizer, except that the origin there's a, here, there's a Z2 stabilizer. And then here, there's a trivial stabilizer. So it kind of looks like A1, but the, the stabilizer group jumps down at the origin. And then if, if you translate what that, what that means in terms of uh, separatedness, so we have, let's call this stack X. And so we, we have, we certainly have a cover u to x, uh, but u is the non-separated affine line, so I could just, you know, find an a1, just choose one of the copies of a1 over it. And let's think about what the stabilizer group scheme of this map f is. What is the automorphism group scheme of f, you know, over a1? Well, generically, this is e2 stabilizer, and over the origin, there's just, uh, yeah, it, it's fixed. So it looks like the group scheme looks like uh, you have, so here's, yeah, here's my A1, and then I have the identity component, and then the, like the minus one part, except I, I remove, yeah, the minus one over the, the origin. And it's clearly, this is not, not finite. And separating this is the, is the condition that the diagonal is proper, uh, or equivalently, all the automorphism group schemes of of, 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 of like points of, of X are, are proper over the base. And, and maybe I should yeah, point out in this stack as like, so th this gives me a group scheme G over A1 and our stack X is equivalent to the classifying stack over A1 of this group scheme. So yeah, so separatedness for Deline Mumford stacks, it sort of it ensures that the stabilizer groups don't jump down in cardinality uh, as you degenerate. And maybe another example uh, is that BGM itself is not separated. And I mean, the reason is that if you take the diagonal and base change, you, well, yeah, you get back GM. And this is like an affine group scheme, but it's not proper. And, and so you see like groups like GM or GLN, their classifying stacks are never gonna be, are never gonna be separated. And, and the fact here is that, you know, if, if, you, if you have an algebraic stack with affine diagonal, which is a rather weak condition, then X is separated if and only if the diagonal is actually finite. Right, and, and, and the reason this is true is that, it would, okay, if X is separate, if X has affine diagonal, um, yeah, the diagonal is affine. If X is separated, then the diagonal is proper and proper plus affine like equals finite. Um, and so algebraic stacks with affine diagonal and positive dimensional stabilizer groups can never be separated. So maybe this is maybe a important point here. Uh, so algebraic stacks with affine diagonal and positive dimensional stabilizers are never separated. 
And so examples that what that uh, are a one mod gm, or or like in the context of moduli, uh, is the the like the stack of vector bundles over a curve. These are not separated. Mg we will we will show mg is separated. We don't know that yet as a course. Like uh, later, we'll show mg is, is separated, even proper. Uh, right, and that gets us to now, yeah, now I want to state the value criterion, which I had just uh, yeah, I mentioned last time. So like with schemes, there's a, there's a value criterion for either of these notions, universally closed, proper, or separated, but maybe let's just, set, let's just focus on uh, the proper condition, which is three. So we tested on valuation rings, or in the Ethereum setting, we test on discrete valuation rings, and properness is saying every such diagram like this, um, after possibly an extension of, of the valuation rings, you, you can find a lift. And moreover, given any such diagram, any two lifts are isomorphic. Okay, so it works just like the value criteria for schemes, but there is this one additional subtlety that you have to allow extensions. And uh, right, and this is equivalent yet yeah, to, yeah, for, um, yeah, it turns out for schemes, if you have an extension, if you, if you have a lifting after an extension, you can use that to actually produce an extension over the original DVR. But that's, so that's properness. Uh, and it's, it's this value of criterion that we're gonna use to show that MG is proper. So, so later we'll show MG is proper. Uh, what we need to show if you translate this condition is that you know you start with um, you need to show that for all DVRs R that when you start with maybe a, a curve let's call it C star over the fraction field of that DVR and you want to know if you can extend it to here that given such a diagram well there, that you can at least find a, after an extension spec r prime spec k prime so there there exists this such that when you restrict this curve to k prime there exists an extension c say over r prime that extends this curve and and, and there, it's unique so the, the picture is well, well we'll get into this later but you should have this picture in your head where you know, your spec R looks like uh, a one dimensional base and, and you have a, a, cent a central point of it and you're starting with, you know, a family of curves, except you don't know what's, what goes in here. And you need to show that there after, that after possibly extending the, the base curve that you can fill it in with maybe a, a singular fiber. Right, uh, and maybe the other example I, I would want, want to show, uh, maybe I, I should just return. Let me just say, like, we, we saw in the last page, page that BGM was not separated. Uh, and you can also see this via the value of the criterion. Let's just do this example again, BGM. If you translate the value of the criterion for separatedness, Well, we need to t we need to take look at diagrams like this. Maps to BGM correspond to GM torsors, or equivalently to to, tri to 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 line bundles. And this is a field. All line bundles are trivial. So this is you know the trivial GM torsor. And, and R is a local ring, so any extension here would also be trivial. So let's suppose we have two different extensions, both given, but they're both the, the trivial one, the trivial GM torsor, 
But remember, part of the data of these commutative diagrams are also these two isomorphisms. So in this case, what that means is you're specifying an isomorphism. So you're given an isom of uh, the commutativity of this gives you an isomorphism of the two trivial GM, uh, the two tri trivial. So let's call these, these maps H1 and H2. We have a, an isomorphism over the restriction. But this is the data of just an element of GM of K. And the value criterion for, for separating this says, will, will tell you that you, is asking whether you can extend this isomorphism over spec R. And so the point here is that this does not extend, necessarily extend to GM over R. I mean, for instance, you could just take, you know, if pi uh, is a uniformizing parameter of R, you could just take the, the element like one over pi inside here as your isomorphism of the, the, the trivial families over spec K that does not extend to an isomorphism over spec R. So I'm partly saying this to em emphasize, yeah, that you can see that BGM is not separated through the value of criterion, but you need to think, you need to, yeah, you, you sort of, the, the, the two commutativity in these diagrams shows up in these conditions. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's everything I wanted to say in terms of recapping. So I, it's a good place to pause for questions. So, is it obvious that every principal bundle over spec R is trivial? Oh, so the question was, is it obvious that a principal bundle over spec R is trivial? And in this case it is because it's, it, we're taking principal GM torsors and a GM torsor corresponds to a line bundle and over a local ring like spec R, all line bundles are trivial. Okay, thank you. Other other questions? Uh, I guess MG should be MG bar near the top. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. So we have we have uh, two goals in mind for today. One is discussing quasi-coherent cheese, and the other is this local structure of the Lee Mumford stacks. So we'll start with quasi-coherent cheese. And uh, I should say, yeah, actually, for a lot of this chapter and for a lot of this course, we actually won't need that much about quasi-coherent cheese until the very, very end when we talk about projectivity. Uh, we'll, we'll need to construct ample line bundles, and we'll use sheep theory. Uh, but in fact, for even for the proof of the Kiyomori theorem of the existence of coarse moduli spaces, the only th the only sheaf we're going to use is the structure sheaf. Uh, but for Deline Mumford stacks, the theory of quasi coherent cheese, it works just like scheme. So you know, it's there's. I just want to give a, a, a quick summary of, of and, and and just emphasize that it does work exactly like schemes. So we'll, we'll start. And there is subtlety of extending this to algebraic stacks, which I won't address. So we're just gonna we're just gonna have define quasi coherent cheese under Lee Mumford stacks. And so we define the small tau site of a Lee Mumford stack just as we define it for schemes. So the small tau site is uh, is just the category of schemes that are a tau over the stack. So an object here is just a morphism from U to X, which is a tau, and where this is a scheme. And then coverings are, and, and morphisms are, are, are morphisms over, step, over the stack X, so two commutative diagrams. Um, a covering, 
is just a, a sequence of a tau maps like this, where these, these maps, again, these are maps over X. Uh, and so these are tau maps such that the disjoint unions are X. Okay. And so this gives us the notion uh, of sheaves. And this gives us, uh, yeah, sheaves on uh, X et al. Like we, we, can, we can discuss sheaves on any site. And we can take the category, let's write this, sheaves on X. This is the category of sheaves. And, uh, and so it, it, it just maybe to spell it out, if you have a sheaf here, what, what that means is, is, is for every, so this, this part of the data here is that for all schemes, U and a tau maps to X, where it is here, U is a scheme, you, you have an associated, you have a, a set of sections defined over that. Uh, element. This and, might be a silly question, but sure. does, does, since your, your category is really de only defined in terms of schemes, do you does this site remember what it means to cover your stack X, or does that even make sense? Uh, like, does it does it remember like the presentation as some sort of cover, or is that not? not no, no, it doesn't. Does it, no. Okay. Yeah, no, you have. Yeah, it, it's, it's it, yeah, it's not. It, yeah, it does not remember like a particular presentation. If you like, if you want, you, you could define a sheaf by just defining it on a on a particular presentation. But in some sense, this we're, in this definition, we're defining it on all. Not, actually, not all. Yeah, on, on all presentations and even all. Yeah, all tau maps. But I guess what I'm asking is, does the site know objects that cover this the 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 stack, or? Uh... Uh... Well, the site does because we have coverings as well. I guess total. Oh, I guess yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, okay. I'll have to think about it. Um, so, for instance, can you recover the DM stack from its small et al. site in some way? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, that's an advanced question. I guess no. Uh, I'd have to think about this. I mean, that's a more, yeah, that's an advanced question. We won't really need this, but uh, I, I would guess no, right? Uh, well, I'm happy I managed to ask an advanced question. <laughs> but, uh, it's fine if we get another now. Yeah, the small tau site of like, uh, even of a scheme and like a no point in thickening of that scheme should be the same. Or, I hope I'm not saying something wrong. Right. Oh, okay. So we have we have sheaves, uh, and so by, by definition, so so you have sections over every you know uh, a tau morphism from a scheme, and uh, and you can actually extend this. In fact, can extend to a tau maps like u to x from dm to x. Where the idea is you simply choose a presentation. So this is a tau presentation, and then you take, you know, the corresponding groupoid R, which is yeah, the fiber product of U and U over the stack U. <laughs> and then you just define uh, you can define uh, sections over this a tau map. By just taking you, 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 you by taking the, the thing that forces it to be sort of a sheaf, uh, you take the equalizer of sections over U uh, under the two maps to sections over R, and what this actually allows you, yeah. So, so if you wanted, you could use this construction then to to enlarge your site. To con where the objects are all the lean Mumford stacks a tau over this, and and then the way I've defined it here would be like would be a, a basis for that, 
site, our basis for that topology. But the main reason I'm doing this here is that in particular, we can def now define global sections. That we take the global sections of a sheaf is just the sections of F under the identity map. Right. So we, we have we have global global sections uh, and you know and then we have a lot of uh, similar properties to sheaves of schemes. Maybe I'll just say it this way. There exists adjoint functors. Uh, maybe it, okay. For any map x to y delete muffer stacks, you have adjoint functors that from okay, you can take it. You can push forward. And you can also take the pre-image. And this is defined just like with schemes, like the push forward. Suppose I have uh, an F inside here. Let me do it in the color. F, then F push forward of F is a sheaf on Y, which to any etal cover, to any object, you just take F over the fiber product. Where? This is a DM stack, so we, we're using this extension of sections. And I like, and the inverse image is always trickier to define. But it's, it's in this case, it's just like with schemes. So if I wanted to take the inverse image of G evaluated on U to X, where this is a tau, I just take the limit uh, over all sections, whoops, of all Whoops. Yeah, all, all refinements. So let's say V to Y. Where this limit is over all diagrams U to V X to Y. Where everything is a tau. Wait, I, I I don't think you can define global sections that way because the it's only defined on the sheaf is only defined on schemes, right? Maps from schemes. Yes. Can I mean? Oh, you mean up way up here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But th this is what I was trying. To, yeah, uh, it's only defined on maps from schemes. But that, that's why I did this little discussion here to extend to sections over any map, uh, oh. a map of DM stacks. Could you not also define global sections via an appropriate limit or co-limit um, in the original category without adding in maps from Deline Mumford stacks without being able to evaluate? Yeah, I think you could. Uh, yeah, yeah. OK, thanks. Wasn't sure if there was some technicality that. No, I th yeah, I think that that's right. I was trying to define it in like the yeah, most explicit way possible. But right, yeah, for the pre-image, you just take the limit, like the limit over all sections where, where V uh, contains, sort of contains the image of U. Right, and then, it, so as an example of a, of a sheaf, uh, we have the structure sheaf. Sorry, can I ask one thing? Mm -hmm. it, it, in the map from U to V, you wrote a tall. Are you are you saying that, uh, that map have to be a tall just at the bottom in your little diagram? Uh, so like U is a tall over X and V is a tall over Y. But is it clear that you? I'm maybe oh, I'm just. Yeah, this map doesn't need to be a tall. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, you're right because otherwise that would have applied X to Y as a tall. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right, so as an example of a sheaf, we have the structure sheaf. And uh, so we'll, we'll denote it O of X. And for, uh, for 
you know, a tau morphism from a scheme U, we just take the, the global sections of U. And now we have a sheaf of rings on this site. We can define OX modules just like with schemes. And we have a, a similar adjoint functors. We can push forward and pull back OX modules along maps of DM stacks. And so here, I've, I've just sort of saved time by, by writing it out. This just denotes the category of OY modules. Um, and the pullback is done like with schemes where you, you tensor with the structure sheaf to make it an OX module. Right, so now, okay, now we have OX modules and then the one additional thing we need is quasi queer cheese. So we say in OX module F is quasi coherent. If it's restriction to any, a, a tau cover is quasi coherent. If for all maps from a scheme, uh, the restriction I'll write it as F to U, but to the Zariski topology of U, to uh, this is the Zariski, the small Zariski topology of U um, is, is quasi coherent on U. It's a quasi coherent OU module. And the point is that, yeah, U. You, I mean, to get a Zariski sheaf on U for any open set in U, sort of the composition then to X is still a tau, so we still have sections over that. So you just you, you just only remember those sections, and you get then you get a sheaf in the Zariski topology of U, and we're requiring, and you you also get an OU module, and we're requiring that that OU module is is quasi coherent. And we have the same sort of functors between. Uh, the push forward. So the fact is that if so, this is let's let's take a morphism of DM stacks. One is that the you can pull back, and this preserves quasi coherence. And the same thing with the push forward with a weak separation condition. If it's quasi compact and quasi separated, then the push forward also preserves quasi coherence. Great. Any questions on the definitions? Oh, these facts take work. I'm not I, yeah, just because I have limited time. I'm not going to do this. I want to get to MG, but yeah, they 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 take work. Uh, but it's. It's manageable. So, um, the definition of quasi coherent is it enough to check it once for an etal presentation? Uh, for a single etal presentation, um, I have to think about that. It's a good question. I mean, you could, mm, I'm not sure actually. Um, you can, uh, may, I'll say a, a few words later about how you can define them. And the, yeah, like in the moduli context, maybe in the groupoid context, if you have a, a given presentation and, uh, and you, then you take the corresponding groupoid, you, you, you could define, maybe this is the answer to your question. Then, then you could define a quasi coherent chief. So maybe, so, so if we have, okay, in the bottom left, if we have X, and you choose an Atal presentation, and then you take the corresponding groupoid, then, and you only wanted to define it in terms of this data, it, you would define it just like you would do with descents. You would say it's a quasi coherent sheaf on F, but you would need an isomorphism over the pullbacks to R that satisfy co cycle condition. So I don't think you can get away with just saying that. I, 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 I guess I still don't know the answer to your question. But. I think when, like for BG, if it's just a module, it'll definitely pull back to a vector space on the natural cover. And you, that would su suggest that all modules are quasi coherent over BG, which seems not true. I don't really know. Just, yeah, uh, a good point. 
yeah, let me avoid this. Let me, uh, uh, yeah, let, let's yeah, let's save this for the discussion period. Okay. But I, I do want to talk. That, like Gabe just brought up a good example, which is DG. So let, let's talk about quasi coherent sheaves on on DG. Let's, so let's take G to be finite. Then the category of quasi coherent sheaves on BG um, is, is equal to the category of representations of G. Algebraic, like Eric, linear representations. And you can see this, you know, uh, either by taking sort of the groupoid presentation of BG, which is spec K over BG, and then you have this groupoid, which is just G. And uh, and so when if you pull up, yeah, the the the, co the descent condition corresponds to an action of G on the vector space. And so let's take a vector space V and try to understand and let's consider what these what these natural maps. So I have over BG. So I have sort of this diagram. Let's call this map P. This is our Atal presentation. And then we just have the structure map to spec K. And uh, the first thing you could do, so v, let's take V to be a G representation. If I pull it back along P, this is just equal to V as a vector space. You forget the G action. Um, on the other hand, if I, I push it forward, I, I recover the invariance. You could also ha ask what happens if I, let's say, let's suppose I have a, a vector space W over K. If I just, if I pull that back via pi, this is just W as a trivial G representation. Um, or you can also think about W on spec K and what happens if you push it forward. Well, what you get then, well, it's the same thing as, as taking W as, a, as, as just yeah, as a vector space and tensoring it with the push forward of just the one dimensional representation. And this here is the regular representation, which is just, you can think of as the global functions on G. Right, so you said, yeah, but this is, yeah, sort of an important point that quasi coherent sheaves on BG correspond to representations and therefore quasi coherent sheaves on like a moduli stack corresponds to like a family of representations under the stabilizer groups. Uh, great. Uh, so I just defined quasi coherence. Uh, Wait, yeah, this. Makes me think I forgot to say something. Uh... All right, so yeah, where are we? I wanna give uh, just another, maybe another perspective uh, of how to view quasi coherent G's. So if you have F, quasi coherent sheaf on a Deleon Mumford stack, then, you know, by definition, you have a maps, by definition, you have quasi coherent sheaves on all the pullbacks under a tau maps, but you can even extend this to, to all, not just a tau maps, but all maps. So you get, you, you actually get the data for all maps S to X, um, where this is a scheme and this is not necessarily a tau. You have, you, you have a, you get a quasi coherent sheaf. Well, let's write it F S on S with the property that, uh, with the property that if you have a morphism S to T of, of schemes, you know, over X that, uh, that, that you have a canonical isomorphism between the pullback of FT to F S. And, and this is sort of a useful perspective in the context of moduli problems, because for instance, like uh, let's, let's define a, a nice quasi coherent chief on MG. 
So I'm going to define a sheaf H. This is going to be the Hodge bundle. It's quasi coherent sheaf on MG, where I, what I need to do is just for every morphism, say S to MG, I need to define a quasi coherent sheaf on S. But yeah, this map corresponds by definition to a family of smooth curves. And I, I just, I define to so H, S, I could take, uh, I could take the push forward of the relative canonical sheaf. And because of properties of the canonical sheaf, uh, like if I push forward and pull back, it's the same as pull back and push forward. So you get these canonical isomorphisms and therefore it defines a quasi coherent sheaf. All right, and this is called the, yeah, the Hodge bundle. But there's a lot of other constructions you could do. You know, you could take the determinant of this thing, or you could maybe, you could have inserted, you could have taken powers inside here. Um, and it's a very useful way, like in the moduli problems using, using the geometry of what you're parameterizing to cook up natural sheaves. And then you use them maybe to, for instance, what we'll do is we'll use that to, to get line bundles on our, our moduli space and then try to verify that they're ample. But now once you have quasi coherent sheaves, there's a whole other like sequence of notions you can introduce. And I, I'm not gonna spell them out here, but you, you can define vector bundles, right? This should be, uh, these should be locally free, um, quasi coherent sheaves of finite rank. And then inside here, you have line bundles you can discuss coherent sheaves, at least with X, like say, say X and Ethereum. Uh, you can discuss O, X algebras, A, and then you can use this to define the relative spectrum. Like given an O, X algebra properly defined, you have this sheafy spec of A over X, which is an affine morphism. Oh, I disappeared. Right, all right. Any any questions on this? I think that basically sums up, yeah, this is my quick recap of quasi-coherent, quasi-coherent. When, when you say that isomorphism is canonical, do you mean natural? I mean, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, I think I mean, yeah. What do you mean by natural? Yeah, let's say natural. Natural means that there's a commuting square. Like if I have a. Yeah, that's what we want, right? That, like, I think that, right. If you wanted to spell out what, like if you had a, a trip, like a, a composition of morphism, say S to T to U, you'd want these to pull back natural, so naturally, yeah. Oh, that's so that isomorphism is the part of the data of quasi-coherent shift in this description? Well, the, uh, but the, but that's not how I've defined it, but I'm saying this is, uh, the, yeah, this would, be, this would be an equivalent perspective. You could give an equivalent definition like that. Okay, I see. And how do you define stocks of such modules? Does it even make sense? No, it's a good question. Uh, I, we're not really, I mean, we're not. Uh, you, argue, you always argue in terms of a presentation and then you can take stocks. But. Um, oh, okay, uh, so only when, when you present the, 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 the stack and then, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, but on the other hand, like part of the reason I wanted to introduce the residual derivative, uh, I keep talking about the classifying stack of stabilizers is because this is like the, the right analog of the, you know, of the fiber of uh, a quasi coherent sheet is the restriction to the residual derb, not maybe to a field value point. Like the fibers of sheaves on schemes, you, you always restrict to the residue fields of points. Here, right. if you do that here, you lose information. Like the difference between from going, like if you have. Uh, because it doesn't remember the, the stabilizer structure. Exactly, it doesn't remember the stabilizer. So here's your PG, which is sometimes the residual derb. 
and you have a quasi clear sheet. If you pull back all the way to spec K, you lose you lose how the stabilizer group is acting. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, thank you. No problem. All right. Uh, we actually, yeah. and so I'm going to turn to the third topic where we, we won't actually use these quasi coordinate sheets, but uh, we will later in the course. Well, that. All right. So now the third third part of this course is local structure of DM stacks. And uh, so yeah, here's the theorem. So I take a separated domain Mumford stack. I take a point defined over an algebraically closed field. But yeah, that's what I mean by, by, by geometric point. I mean, K is K bar. And I have a stabilizer group, GX. And this point, because I, I'm, I'm taking uh, K equals K bar, the stabilizer group is an honest, you know, finite group. It's not like, uh, you know, say Z mod three over spec R where it's just a form of Z mod three or sorry, mu three, yeah, over spec R. So it's honest finite group. And, and, and then, and then uh, the conclusion is that a tau locally around this point, it's isomorphic to a quotient stack by the stabilizer. So this gives you an a tau cover tau and affine. And more, moreover, you have this sort of important property that uh, F induces an isomorphism of the stabilizer groups at W. So here, W is, is sort of a choice of a preimage. So I, I, I have spec A, and then this is my quotient stack, uh, W. And uh, this maps then to X. And so this is my, my point X. And I could even have W to be a point of this, yeah, of the spec A. And the condition is then that, what I mean isomorphism of stabilizer groups is that it's an induced map from that the automorphism group, you know, in this category W of K of W maps isomorphically to the automorphism group in X. Of x. Actually, and what this actually implies is that the gx action on spec a fixes this this w as a k value point of spec a. Oh, that was yeah. And um, right, so th this theorem is really important because it, it tells you that locally your stacks are, are quotient stacks. So really, the upshot. From like a from more of like a philosophical perspective, as this tells us is that is that we can view DM stacks as these nice quotients of affine schemes by finite groups as the like uh, glue to tau locally. And I'm guessing some of you are thinking, wait, didn't we define the lean Mumford stacks as just gluing schemes together a tau locally? How is this any different? And it's different because that we're getting that our tau covers are actually preserving the stabilizer groups. So they're preserving, so they're sort of it's sort of an analog of like a Nisnevich a tau covering. Nisnevich a tau covering is one that you can arrange that there's always a preimage that induces an isomorphism on residue fields. Here, you can arrange, here this might not induce an isomorphism. This might allow residue field extensions, but uh, it at least induces a sort of an isomorphism on the, on the stabilizer groups. So it is almost inducing an isomorphism on residual jerks. You could do better than this if you want, but this will suffice for us. Right, all right, so my goal in the, in the remaining uh, 20 minutes. Actually, I don't think I'll need all that time is to is to prove this. 
So here's some, uh, I'm gonna get started with the proof. I'm just gonna introduce some notation. And that, so we, we, we're gonna let, we're gonna choose an Atal presentation to start. So let, 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 let's let this be an Atal presentation where U is a scheme. And we're gonna denote, we're gonna take use of the, these fiber products. So I'm gonna take the default fiber product and observe that a map from S. So what this, what this stack classifies is that a map from U to X to D. Well, if you think about what that is, it's a bunch of objects of U that become, and then isomorphisms in X. So, so I might as well just fix an object in X. So this is the same data as an object S in X. And if I consider the corresponding fiber product, so this is maybe X. I also have D sections. S1 to SD. And, uh, and I'm going to set U mod X D zero to be the open, open, the open um, substack, uh, where, which is the complement of all diagonals. So in other words, if, if I take, uh, if I just repeat this notion here and I map instead into this open set, then I'm getting disjoint sections. Yeah. And the final piece is, uh, what we also have is we have SD actions. SD acts on both this locus and it's an invariant locus inside here, which is permutes, permuting the sections. So this, is, this will be our, our construction. Uh, all right, so let, let, let's now prove it precisely. So the way we start, whoops. So let's choose a particularly nice presentation. Let's choose u over x, a tau. Uh, and let's choose this to be an affine scheme. And uh, by just for, and I can arrange that if I take this, the pre-image here, that is just one point. Um, I know it's a tau. I don't need to do any slicing argument here. I just like, I could just throw away all of the, uh, up, of, all of the points in the fiber other than one particular point. And moreover, I sort of had this assumption here that X yeah, was separated. That implies that the diagonal is affine. And so if U is an affine scheme, that means that this map is even an affine morphism. Yeah. The separatedness assumption is not necessary for this proof. I mean, it, it goes through fine with if you if you have um, any DNM stack, as long as you. I think you need to know that diagonal is quasi-affine, but that that's that's true. Although that fact we haven't shown. But anyway, I'm I'm restricting to separated DNM stacks here. Uh, and so now let's let D be the cardinality of this finite group, being the stabilizer group, and so. This map here is finite et al of degree D. And in fact, if I base change one more time, right, I, what I get is the stabilizer. All right, and then I had, so, and then I had these constructions. I had, uh, I had U over X to the D, right? This is just this fiber product. And I know this is uh, I know this is an affine scheme. 
because U is affine and the morphism to X is affine. So I actually get an affine scheme. And that implies that uh, I'm going to define this as W as the open, open, as the open substack um, parameterizing disjoint sections. And th then this is quasi affine. And remember here that actually, uh, uh, maybe I could, yeah, that we had. Uh, that we knew what objects of this were, were, right? Objects of this were uh, disjoint sections. Oh, uh, of the open, yeah. So this was this is W. So, and and for instance, so if I have such an object here, you know, I can construct like given. S to U X D zero. If I just get, these are disjoint sections. So if I could, if I just consider sort of the disjoint union of all the images of at these sections S I over U, I get a closed uh, subscheme of U S over U. Oh, sorry, that's S. And the point is that this map is finite et al and of degree D. In fact, it's the trivial finite et al cover of degree D. And right, I have an SD action, SD acts on UX D zero, and I, and I could take the quotient. Oh, this was W, yeah. I could take the quotient W mod SD. And what this classifies then, this, this stack classifies like uh, a map from S into W mod SD is, is the stackification of like forgetting, uh, is this like sort of the stackification of such objects. So I'm gonna get finite tau covers that are not necessarily trivial. So this, this corresponds to Z inside US over S where this map is finite et al and degree D. And so for instance, I have um, I have an object. So I, I have, I can define W. I have an object over the stack W mod SD by just thinking about what, what, what happens if uh, yeah, that, I have the following object, I have u over x, I have the k point I begin with, x, and I know this fiber product, I, ar I arrange this fiber product to be gx. And I, I take z to be equal to gx as my closed subscheme. And, uh, and, and a choice of ordering, maybe I'll go on to the next page, uh, where, let me just, yeah, copy this part, or maybe this part. Right, we have this, and uh, we have this point here, and what I want to say now is like a choice of ordering, uh, like or, of ordering elements in the stabilizer gives a lift W tilde actually to, to the scheme W, to this quasi affine scheme W. And here, may, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, I'll argue that you, you could check this fact. This, that if under the SD action, the stabilizer of W tilde uh, under the SD action is precisely the stabilizer, GX, inside SD, right? 
where this is this is the the stabilizer that actually embeds into SD because D is the number of elements, right? This is the like the regular one of the standard representations, right? And just the stabilizer moves around those elements, and that gives me this inclusion. Uh, right. So we have a, a, our picture. Just to maybe recap where we are and what we know it, uh, is that I have. So I started with X. I took an, a, a, a nice presentation, and then I have I constructed this stack over here within that has an SD action. Oh, that was yeah. And then inside here I have SDX, and then this was my W. I then take my quotient mod SD, and this maps to X. And uh, and basically, yeah, this, is ba this is our presentation. We're basically done. This is a so I, I, maybe a, you also need to check. This is our map F. This check F is representable. Well, oh, that one that is defined too that it's representable. Uh, and a tau. But actually, it's a tau because every everything in this diagram is a tau. So it's, uh, yeah, the talentness is easy. And the representability, you just need some patience to sit down and check it. Um, but we also know, and uh, this fact uh, implies that F induces an ISO at the, uh, on stabilizers. At W. So I think we're basically there. What else? What else is remaining? Well, there's a couple of things actually, right? Where there's uh, well, right now we've basically arranged everything in this theorem except for well, I guess three things. One is that we have W, which is quasi-affine, not affine. Two is that we have an action of SD rather than the stabilizer, and three is we haven't. Uh, shown that the map is affine. So let me quickly sort of sketch that. Let me just, yeah. First is that, so maybe for the first issue here, uh, is that we can just, we could just consider instead the, the stabilizer, the, the, this composition. The stabilizer lives inside SD, so I, I could just forget about SD. And this has, this map, these map, this composition um, is, is a tau and also preserves the stabilizer at W. Okay. And, uh, but we also know, so maybe to, to handle the affineness, we also know that W is a fixed point inside this quasi affine scheme is fixed by the stabilizer. So therefore, if I just choose any affine open that choose W inside W and affine open containing this point W, and then and then I could take the intersection under the translates of this. Um, they call this W double prime. W is still in here, still affine, and now it's G invariant. Uh, so that's that. This is our spec A, right? And the last thing I owe you is three. Why is it affine? And here we're going to use that our assumption that the, the stack was uh, uh, is has affine diagonal. Uh, so what we what we have? So we now have spec A mod the stabilizer mapping to the stack. And we know it's representable. And I want to argue it's affine. But I also know that after a finite cover, this is a, a so after a finite surjective, even a tau cover, I know this composition is, is affine. Because x has affine diagonal. 
And this is, will be enough if you can argue via descent, for instance, let's just choose like U affine over here, choose a, a tau presentation, pull this back. I'll just write this as U prime, U double prime. And then this is still a finite map. Uh, U double prime is affine. U is affine. And then we, and then we use Sarah's, Sarah's criterion tells us that affineness descends under finite morphisms. Just, yeah. It tells us there, therefore that uh, U prime is affine, which in turn tell, tells us that spec A my GX to X is affine. And I think that wraps up the proof. I'll end the recording now and then we'll have questions.